I'm Noah Kantrowitz. This is how the internet works. Uh, so what is the internet? Senator Ted Stevens, famous quote. Uh, he did not quite understand what he was saying, but he was possibly more right than he understood. Uh, the internet, at a very low level, is in fact a series of tiny tubes connected in a vast network. Uh, but this is probably a slightly nicer way to think about the internet. Uh, we've never ever in the history of mankind had access to so much information so quickly and easily. But because this is a talk, let's talk about one piece of information, specifically Google.com. We're going to look at the steps involved in getting the web page www.google.com. Uh, we're only going to talk about the pieces of this that re relate to the internet, so we're not talking about keyboard interrupts or HTML rendering or CSS or any of that, just how do we get the data that represents this site. So we've opened a web browser. We've typed in HTTPS colon slash slash www.google.com. I'm sorry, can we turn on the monitor here? It's quite loud. Sorry. I, uh, I do tend to, to project a bit in, uh, in presentation mode. OK. So we've opened a web browser. We've typed it in. First thing the browser needs to know, where is google.com? Enter stage right, DNS, or the domain name system. Uh, DNS is the protocol that your computer uses to find what the IP address is for a host name. The most common way to interact with this is by the, is the get host by name function in your operating system. Most browsers will be fancy enough, they write their own version of that function internally, but it's the same process either way. We need to make a DNS query, so that means we need to make a DNS message or packet. This will take the question of what is the A or address record of www.google.com and put it into a format that a DNS server can understand. The first section, any DNS packet, will be the headers. So these are uh, options and fields that apply to all different types of DNS messages. The ID field is an opaque number. The DNS server will include this back in the reply, so we know which, que which query is being answered when we get a server reply. The QR and opcode fields set the type of the packet and if this is a query or a reply. The other fields in that line set various mode flags for the packet. And there's four count fields. These set the number of question, answer, uh, authority, and additional record sections. So for us, we're asking one question. What is the address of Google.com? So we're going to have one for that and zero for all the others. So next, we have to make that one question section. So question sections are fortunately much easier. Uh, we have the name that we are asking for. So in this case, it's www.google.com. The type of record we are asking for, which is an A or address record, we want to get its IP address. And the class of the value, this will almost always be one for the internet. You could hypothetically use DNS for ask for things that aren't internet names, but those don't exist. Uh, so let's put the header and question sections together and fill in all the fields. So all I did was fill in the data in the format that the protocol specifies and convert it into binary. This looks a bit more intimidating, but it's the same thing we saw before, just with all the data filled in. That's the header section. That's the question section. And it's binary. We can turn binary into hexadecimal. So here we go. This is just converting it into bytes. We have a DNS query. That's what it looks like. There's nothing special about this, except in that how everyone, namely the people requesting things and the people serving DNS uh, queries, will parse and use this data. But on its own, it just looks like some bytes, just like anything else on a computer. But we have the bytes. We're ready to go. We want to send this to a DNS server. Which server do we send it to? So this is a point where it varies depending on your operating system. Each OS will expose some form of system-specific API to get what is the system-level DNS servers, the kind of things that you'd configure in your network settings. So this is things like get network params on Windows or network services on Mac or the various resolver APIs on Linux and Unix systems. Normally, you'd have multiple DNS servers in there just in case one isn't available or one's slightly faster. But we're just going to look at the first one, 208.201.224.11, which happens to be the primary DNS server for my ISP at home. So we know where we're going to send this query. Uh, next, we need to encode that data in a way that everything on the internet will be able to get that data, get that query to the DNS server, some, some format that we will use to do that. And those formats are IP and UDP. So uh, as the name suggests, IP is the core protocol of the internet. It is the thing that basically everything on the internet speaks. Uh, back in the really old days, uh, network protocols were specific to every manufacturer. Honeywell had their own, DEC had their own, et cetera. So you couldn't really connect networks together if they were made by different manufacturers. IP was the unifying protocol that allowed people to connect inter-network communications. That was the nucleus of the internet that we have today. Protocols are applied in a nested fashion. So just like before, we had a DNS header section and a DNS question section. Uh, in this case, we're going to have IP as the sort of top level. Inside that, we're going to have UDP. And inside that, we're going to have our DNS query data. 
IP, you specify a target IP address. That is the way that you identify which server on an IP network, namely the whole internet being one giant IP network, you are trying to send this to. And the port in the UDP data is where you specify which specific program or service on that machine you want to send it to. By convention, we have all agreed on the entire internet that everyone will use port 53 for DNS data. So we just know that when we are making a DNS packet to send on the internet, we're going to use UDP and port 53. So let's look at the first layer. So right on top of the DNS data, we're going to have a UDP header. So this is information used by the UDP protocol to figure out which port and uh, which service to send information to. It's fortunately a bit simpler than the DNS header. Uh, really, the only thing we care about in here is the destination ports. Like I said, that's going to be port 53, and that's just known because everyone agrees on it. There's no, like, you're not calculating that based on anything related to the question. It's just mutual agreement. Uh, the source port will be filled in automatically by the operating system, generally, to just a random source port. Then on top of that UDP header, we're going to have an IP header. This is a little bit more complicated than UDP, so let's look at this piece by piece. So the first thing in there is the version number. When people say IPv4, that's because there is actually a version number and it is set to 4 for all of your packets. Uh, fun fact, there was actually an IPv5. It was an early VoIP streaming protocol designed in 1979. But that's why we had to skip to IPv6 when they wanted to make the next one. Uh, there's a whole lot of fields in here that are mostly used to ensure that the packet is received and processed correctly. Uh, note that there's a couple of different checksum fields in here. Uh, those only apply to the header data. So that is not a checksum on our DNS query. That's just a checksum on the routing and processing information in the IP and UDP headers. There's the TTL, or time to live. That's not actually measured in time, but they called it a TTL anyway. Uh, it's used to ensure that a packet will never get sent around in an infinite loop around the internet and never die. Every hop it goes through, that number gets dropped by one. And when it hits zero, everything is agreed that a packet with a TTL of zero will just be discarded. So it means that if there is some kind of weird loop on the internet, packets will eventually just get dropped on the floor. The protocol tells everything that deals with IP data what kind of information is inside the packet. In our case, it will be 17, meaning UDP data. Then we have two addresses. So the, this tells everything on the internet that's going to process our packets, what the target server is, and where it came from. So we have our fully assembled packet. So we are going to have an IP header on top. Inside that, we're going to have a UDP header. Below that, we're going to have our DNS packet, which itself is composed of a DNS header and a DNS question section. Uh, again, we can fill in all of the data in all of those different fields, and we can turn it into bytes, and we can be ready to send it. But remember, there's nothing special about the word packet or bytes here. This is just an agreement on how to parse data that everything on the internet uses. So we have an IP packet ready to send, but where are we sending it and how? We're going to look at a very simple local network. We're going to assume that you have one computer connected via a wired network to a switch. The switch is then connected to a router, and the router is connected to a cable or DSL modem. We're not really going to talk about the cable or DSL modem specifically, because they don't really interact with the internet -y pieces. They just act like a bridge to a similar device at your ISP. Uh, in a modern home, most of these functions, so the switch, router, and modem, will often be in a single physical box that you just plug in and go, but this, the separate functions of them are still discrete. Most of us have probably seen a network configuration like this before, an IP address and a subnet mask handed out by a router acting as a DHCP server. I won't go into the details of DHCP because that's a whole separate talk, but let's talk about what those, IP, uh, what those values are used for. The IP address determines who we are in an IP network, so it's our identity on an IP network. And the other two values, the subnet mask and the default gateway, are used to build a route table. So what's a route table? Uh, your computer has to know how to send packets, where to send packets. So for a normal laptop or a desktop, your route table will be very simple, usually just three entries. So let's use this route table to figure out where we're going to send this packet. So we have the destination IP address up top. And then on the left side, we have a bunch of destination IP prefixes. So how do we use those? Look at our, our IP address does not start with 127. So that means it does not match the prefix 127.0.0 that means we don't use this row in the route table and we go on to the next one. Again, our target IP address does not start with 192.168.1, so we don't use this prefix. Uh, if, if we did have another machine on the local network, you know, two, two different machines on the same LAN talking to each other, that route would get hit and we would use that to talk directly from machine to machine without going through a router. 
but we finally reached the default route. Default route matches everything that doesn't match any of the other rows. So this is why systems often call it a default gateway or a default route, because it is the default if nothing else has matched. So we hit this row, and we know that we're going to use interface eth0, and we're going to send it to the gateway 192.168.1.1, which is our local router. Ethernet is the next layer that we have to pass through on this system. So Ethernet is the standard that defines how network devices talk to each other. When you see a MAC address, uh, that's talking about Ethernet. That's a, Ethernet address and MAC address are synonyms. Um, Wi-Fi is a similar standard. I will not be talking about it because, again, way too complicated. It is very similar to Ethernet, but instead of using physical wires, you have radio waves. Um, Ethernet networks are divided into segments the way IP networks are divided into subnets. So what's a segment? A segment is a set of network cards on a shared electrical connection. In the original 802.3 standard, it required every computer on the network be connected to the same giant, thick copper cable. Uh, this was originally known as ThickNet. Uh, and every computer would connect electrically to the same wire. And when one person put electricity on the wire, everyone else could see it. And they would use that to communicate. And this was great until you tried to put more than about five machines onto the same wire, because you can't put that much data through a single shared electrical connection. Um, you need really high voltages, et cetera, et cetera. So we grew hubs uh, and the 10 base T system. So hubs mean that you have separate electrical systems, separate segments, but there's still a single collision domain, because hubs just take in data on one wire and repeat it to a bunch of other wires. Um, since then, we have all switched to using switches uh, because they are much more efficient. They only send data out to the port that needs it. Uh, but the terms segment and collision domain have become a little bit blurry. They will usually now be used as synonyms. But technically, a segment is a set of physically electrically connected devices. So in our case, the segment is just between the switch and the computer and the switch and the router. But they are a single collision domain because they share a single local Ethernet connection. Uh, so we've got the DNS message and the IP packet all built. Now we need a new layer. We need a thing called an Ethernet frame. Uh, a frame is one block of data that is sent on an Ethernet network to another Ethernet device. Most of the fields of this are control data for the, uh, the network cards on either end. The type field indicates what kind of data is inside an Ethernet frame. In our case, it will be 0800, meaning it contains IPv4 data. Uh, the first two fields you will often see omitted when people are talking about this because they are just static, always the same, and not really relevant. They're just part of the, the synchronization protocol. The destination address means who on this collision domain, on this Ethernet network, are we talking to? And then we have the data field, which contains that whole big IP packet converted into bytes that we built before. While Ethernet defines the overall network, uh, other standards define the actual electrical signals to put on the light, the electro signals from the wire or light pulses to put onto the fiber optics. Most wired networks these days are going to be using the 1000 base T standard, more generally known as gigabit Ethernet, but we're not going to get into the specifics of the electrical signaling. So we're ready to build our Ethernet frame, send our DNS query to the local router, but we have a problem. The route table told us the IP address of the gateway, but send an Ethernet frame, we need to know its Ethernet address or its MAC address. So we have to pause sending our Ethernet frame and look up the Ethernet address for 192.168.1.1. This is done using a protocol called ARP, or Address Resolution Protocol. ARP sits between Ethernet and IP to translate between hardware and network addresses. We're only going to talk about IP, or sorry, we're going to talk about ARP for IPv4 and Ethernet, but there's uh, similar protocols for other networks. For example, it's called NDP for IPv6. Um, each ARP request uh, contains the question, uh, whoever has this IP address, please send me your Ethernet address, basically. Um, you will note that there's no mention of security anywhere in here. Uh, ARP uses the broadcast Ethernet address because ARP has to pass over an Ethernet network, so it has to send it in some kind of Ethernet frame. But by definition, we don't know the target Ethernet address, because that's what we're asking for. So it sends it to the broadcast Ethernet address, saying, everyone on this Ethernet network, please receive and process this question. And then inside the packet, it has information on whether or not the server, in this case, every machine should reply. In theory, only the person that actually has the IP address, 192.168.1.1, should be allowed to reply. But that's not baked into the protocol anywhere. Anyone can respond to any ARP query. And abuse of this is called ARP poisoning. Uh, ARP packets are intentionally simple. Requests and replies use the same format, just some fields are set to zero or ignored if they're not relevant to the type of message that you're sending. Uh, the important fields are the two pairs of addresses. So for this query, we're going to fill in our sender hardware address and our sender protocol address using our Ethernet and IP addresses, respectively. 
the target hardware address will be left empty because that's what we're asking for. We don't know it. And the target protocol address will be set to 192.168.1.1, which is the IP that we are requesting the MAC address for. Then we wait. ARP can take up to a few milliseconds to process because it has to get to the other computer, be decoded. They have to check if they're supposed to respond to this, build a response, send it back across the network. Uh, because of this and because ARP, you need to know Ethernet addresses to send anything, ARP is heavily cached on every layer of the network. But we're just going to pretend it's not in the cache, so all we can do is sit around and wait for another couple milliseconds. But at long last, in computer terms, we get our ARP reply. We have all the data we need to send our DNS query. So to review, we have an Ethernet frame going to the hardware address of our router. Inside that is an IP packet to the destination of our DNS server. Inside that is a UDP datagram going to port 53. Inside that is a DNS message asking for the A record of www.google.com. This is a lot of work, and we haven't even gotten to the local router yet. <laughs> So the packet is sent down the wire through the switch. The switch reads the destination MAC address and tries to figure out if it, there, if it knows that MAC address, it will send it only to the port that the router is connected to. If it doesn't recognize the MAC address, it'll just send it on all ports and hope that eventually it'll get to the router. But either way, somehow, our Ethernet frame eventually makes it to the router. So the router in our hypothetical home network serves two main purposes. Uh, it is routing between our home network and our ISP network, and it's also doing network address translation. It will need to decode most of the packets to do those, but look at, let's look at each of them in turn. So the first thing it'll do is decode the Ethernet frame. It'll look at the target MAC address, the destination MAC address on the Ethernet frame. It'll say, yes, I am the correct recipient of this, so I'm allowed to process it. Everyone else should disregard it. It'll then decode the IP headers on our, our, our packet and look at the target IP address. It'll say, I am not the target IP address of this, so I need to send this on to somebody else. So then it'll do the same thing our computer did. It'll look at its route table. Now, because it's connected to two networks instead of just one, like our computer is, it has an extra row in its route table, but using it is the same as it was before. So we have the same destination IP address, because it got that from our IP header information. Uh, but it's going to use its own route table, which has four entries instead of three. Still, it doesn't start with 127. It also still doesn't start with 192.168.1.1. The new entry, it doesn't start with that. So again, we get to the default gateway. So the router also has a default gateway, which is some IP corresponding to our ISP. And it's going to do the same exact dance uh, as we did before. And it's going to send it out to the gateway there and Ethernet, uh, Ethernet 1 interface. So the router has decided that it wants to use interface ETH1. The next thing it's going to do is look if there's any special policies on that interface that are configured in the router software. Normally, on most home networks, there is going to be one. There's going to be a network address translation policy. So this exists because we're using the 192.168 address space inside our local network, and that's a private, reserved internet space. Um, that means that if we sent a packet it, that has the source IP address of 192.168.1.2, which is the IP address of our computer, the DNS server wouldn't know where that is, so it could never send us back a reply. So network address translation runs on the router, and it rewrites the private internal IP addresses to public ones. And it keeps a mapping of that translation on the router so that when it gets a reply packet back, it can look it up in that table, undo the translation, and send it back to the internal machine that it needs to. So NAT has finished. It's done the rewrite. Uh, the sending process is just like it was for our computer. We probably need to do an ARP lookup if we don't already have the destination Ethernet address for the thing on our ISP. Uh, we build an Ethernet frame. We encode it using uh, gigabit Ethernet. And we put it onto the wire. This will go through the cable or DSL modem generally. Like I said, I'm not really going to talk about that. The short version is that it gets translated from an Ethernet frame to a similar thing in either DOCSIS or PPPoE, and it just gets translated back when it gets to the ISP office nearest you. Uh, but either way, we have finally gotten onto the ISP network. Uh, generally, this, this is going to be a border router. That's in, because it lives at the edge or the border of the ISP's network. Uh, our plucky little DNS query has finally made it to the internet. Not very far, mind you. Uh, the border router for your home ISP connection is probably only a couple of kilometers from your house. But we are technically on the internet now. So far, both hops we have taken have been relatively small. Uh, they use small route tables with default gateways as a fallback for unknown things. That works great for small scale networks that are arranged like a tree or a hub and spoke layout. Uh, but as we get further into the ISP network, it's going to look less and less like that and more like a mesh. The same process we saw on our router is going to repeat usually a couple of times, two or three more hops through things that are using default gateways. They're just sort of a tree of regional routers in the office of your ISP. Uh, but eventually, they're going to each send it up closer to the ISP backbone connection in the regional office for your ISP. The ISP backbone is a set of high-speed links between offices and data centers that your ISP runs. Uh, 
And eventually, we're going to get all the way up to the local backbone router. So now we have a problem. Uh, all of the routers that we've hopped through so far have been in this sort of tree format where you could use a default gateway. But once we get to the backbone, generally speaking, it's going to look a little more like this. And this is a problem because there's no longer a single path. There's no longer a single default gateway. It's not a fully connected mesh, so we can't just send directly to where we want to go. But it's, it's not clear what we want to use as our next hop. So what do we do? Border gateway protocol is the most widely used routing protocol on the internet today. Uh, what is a routing protocol? The simplest version, it's, it's a way for different routers on the internet to share and synchronize information in their route tables. Uh, this is important as the structure of the internet is always changing. Uh, hardware is swapped out, new links come online, or the natural enemy of fiber links, the backhoe, strikes. Uh, the internet is designed to automatically detect and route around all of these issues. So BGP does this using a gossip-based approach. Each router shares all of the routes that it knows with all of its immediate neighbors called peers. These peering arrangements are usually hardwired, so the system isn't completely self-organizing. There are still humans working out the sort of the, the broadest levels of interconnectedness. But then the BGP, the BGP process takes over and figures out the specifics of all of the routing information. Uh, somewhere uh, on the BGP global system, there is a router that is uh, advertising the prefix 208.201.224.0 slash 19. So just like we saw prefixes in the route tables before, that is the prefix that contains the uh, DNS server we're trying to get to. So each BGP peer announces which prefix it wants to be the destination for, and every neighbor tracks uh, what all of its peers have said and sends what it thinks uh, the best routes are onto all of its neighbors. So every router is gossiping with all of its neighbors about what it thinks the best routes for everything in the world are. Every time it gets a new incoming route, it compares it to all of the routes in its current table. If the new route is better than the existing route for whatever the prefix is, it will replace it, and then it sends that on to all of its other peers. Uh, that also means that every BGP router has to keep the entire route table for the whole world in memory at one time. That is currently about 600,000 routes. Before we talk about BGP anymore, we need to also talk about autonomous system numbers. We've seen a lot of addresses so far, UDP ports, IP addresses, and MAC addresses. Autonomous system numbers are how BGP handles addressing. Uh, an autonomous system number represents an operator that exists on the global BGP network. Uh, historically, they were limited to about two bytes. Uh, however, there have been recent moves to move that to a four-byte number because 80% of the two-byte numbers have been allocated. Generally speaking, an AS number corresponds to a company. Some companies that are very big may have multiple AS numbers for things like geographic separation or logical separation between departments. But in general, you can consider it roughly equivalent to a company. Uh, our DNS server happens to be in AS7065. So every prefix that is broadcast throughout the BGP network is attached to the peer that it came from and the AS that it came from. I should also briefly mention IANA. IANA is the Department of the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which more or less administers the internet. It handles allocating both IP addresses and autonomous system numbers through five regional organizations, AFRNIC for Africa, ARIN for North America, uh, APNIC for Asia and Australia, LACNIC for Latin America and the Caribbean, and RIPE for Europe, Russia, and the Middle East. So those regional registries handle IP and AS allocations for each of their member countries. Every country is assigned to one of the RIRs. But what determines a best route? I'm going to skip a few of the more arcane steps, but this is roughly what it does when it looks at two routes and tries to figure out which of these is better. The first thing is weight. This is an optional local value that's configured on the router itself. Uh, it, it can be used for manual overrides on the routing mesh, so things like a router, uh, a router operator wants to prefer a cheaper or more reliable link, and they just need to manually code that in because the system isn't working the right way. So it's a manual override. Next is local preference. It's a similar type of manual override, whereas weight is specific to a single router. Local pref is shared uh, between all routers on a single autonomous system. But AS path is where things start to get interesting. So as routes are sort of passing through this gossip network, they all track which ASs they have gossiped through. This doesn't track specifically the number of hops, but it tracks the number of distinct autonomous systems that a gossip message went through in order to get to the current router. And shorter AS paths are preferred, because that means it's a more direct connection going through fewer intermediary organizations or companies. Origin refers to how the route was introduced into the BGP network. Routers will prefer routes coming from the same autonomous system instead of external routes. MED, or multi-exit discriminator, allows an autonomous system with multiple connections to another one, so ISPs talking between themselves, uh, an ISP talking to other ISPs. If they have multiple connections, uh, the, one of them can specify, please talk to me on this connection. 
So if you have two connections to an ISP, you can broadcast your preference of which of those two you would like them to use. Both routes will be entered into the BGP system. So if one of those is, say, a high-speed optical link and another is a backup T1 connection, if your optical link goes down, the system will all of a sudden, that route will be invalidated. It'll only be seeing the other one, and it'll route over the backup connection. But it does allow some level of preference. Uh, next is metric. So whereas ASPath looked at distinct autonomous systems that a route passes through, metric is looking at the number of hops through a local network. So this prefers shorter hops through the local network. If we've gotten this far, we fall back to the oldest of the two routes. So this means that it will reduce the instability of equivalent but newer routes being introduced into the BGP system. We don't want to keep using newer routes every time. That's usually called route flapping uh, and can lead to problems. So we always prefer older ones if all else is equal. And finally, there's a couple of tiebreaker options just so that every router will always find the same solution. We don't want any randomness in this process. A quick aside, because this tends to surprise a lot of people, uh, nowhere in this, mention, in this discussion of BGP have I mentioned authorization or authentication. That's because, for the most part, there is none. Uh, anyone on the BGP network can broadcast any prefix they want. Uh, public incidents of this do happen every couple of years. It's generally called BGP hijacking. An example is in 2008, the Pakistani national ISP accidentally started advertising routes for the entire YouTube address space and took down YouTube globally. So BGP is always running in the background. By the time we get to the border router, it's not going to actually be doing anything related to BGP. That's used to build the route table. Uh, but using the route table works just the same as all of our tiny ones. It's just 600,000 routes instead of three or four. So by the time we get to the backbone router, that 600,000 route table already exists. And it knows, OK, so I'm going to this IP address. I'm going to send uh, over to another, uh, another of the backbone routers through the ISP's backbone network going to a, a bigger office within the ISP. Uh, eventually, also known as about 60 milliseconds, we have finally reached the ISP's DNS server after several hops through the ISP's backbone. So just like all of the routers, the DNS server will decode the incoming Ethernet frame, find that it does match the MAC address, so it's allowed to process the rest of the frame. It'll decode the IP header and check the destination IP address. And every time previously it hasn't matched, this time it does. So the server says, I am the destination of this packet. I am going to process what's inside this IP packet. It's then going to process the UDP headers, see that it's being sent to port 53. It'll look at some tables inside the operating system and say, yes, there is a process listening on port 53, so I'm going to unpack the data inside the UDP packet and going to send it into that server process. Then the real work can start. So the DNS server unpacks our uh, header section and our question section out of the DNS data that we made way back 15 minutes ago. Um, and it's going to see that it's asking for the A record for www.google.com. Now, on a busy public DNS server, normally that's going to be cached, but that would be no fun. So let's just pretend it's not in the cache. Uh, our ISP server doesn't directly know the answer to this question. It has no idea what the A record for Google.com is. Now, it could just reply back and say, I don't know the answer to that. But that wouldn't be terribly useful, and we wouldn't get our web page. So there's a special mode in DNS called a recursive query, meaning that you are requesting that if the target DNS server doesn't know the answer, that it go and find it for you. Not every server will allow recursive queries, but an ISP's DNS, ser DNS servers generally will for their customers. But if we're going to find this value from scratch, we have to start from something. So the base of the DNS system globally are these 13 root servers. They are named A through M root servers.net. They exist at 13 fixed IP addresses all over the world. But each of those IP addresses doesn't correspond to one server. It corresponds to hundreds or thousands behind a load balancer to deal with the massive load. Um, so these also don't know the answer to every DNS question. All these do is they map top-level domains like com, net, or org to the TLD-level master name servers for those top-level domains. Uh, all of the root servers are equivalent, so we're just going to pick one. Uh, we have that hardwired list of 13 root servers. It's called the root hint file. It's managed by IANA. You can go download it. It's real fun. Uh, it's going to pick one of those. Let's just say A because it's the first one. It is going to make a new DNS request exactly like our DNS request, except it's making a new one from scratch. Uh, and it's going to send it to a.rootserver.net, asking what is the A record for www.google.com. So that server is then going to have to make a response. It doesn't know what the A record for google.com is. But it does know what servers are authoritative for the com piece of that. So it's going to send us back a whole bunch of domain servers saying, I don't know, but please go ask one of these. Uh, it's going to send us back another 13 servers. They're all going to look like gtldservers.net. So whereas the root servers are run by different organizations, GTLD servers is all run by VeriSign. That's what it means when they say they own the .com domain. Part of that is they run the root name servers for the .com top-level domain. 
So again, we're going to get 13 of these. We pick one. Let's just say it's the first one because it's easier. Uh, and we again send it uh, the same DNS query. What is the A record for www.google.com? Again, TLD servers don't know the answer to this. Uh, when you go and register a domain, you've probably seen there's those little text boxes you have to fill in saying, what is the name server for this new domain name? That is where these end up eventually. So this server maps for each domain that is registered with VeriSign, which is everything under .com because they own .com, uh, what is the name server that knows about that domain? So we're asking for www.google.com. It doesn't know the answer to that, but it goes up and it looks in their database and says, these are the name servers that are tied to google.com. Go ask them. So again, we now pick one of the servers that we got back from a.gtldservers.com and ask it, what is the A record for www.google.com? And that's one of Google's name servers. So finally, we have a server that can answer our question. It sends us back an A request. It's 216.58.192.36. So remember, all of that work that we did in the first half of this talk to build DNS packets and get them shipped over the internet, we just did that six more times because we had three queries and three replies all just to get the answer. And the answer is still only on the uh, ISP's DNS server. So the ISP still has to send us back a DNS reply. So that's just been chewing in the internet for a while. We haven't seen anything so far on our computer. It has to build a DNS message. Before, we had headers and one question section. Now we're going to have headers and one answer section containing the answer to our question. Uh, it's going to send it back the same way that it came, a couple of hops over the backbone system using the route table that was built by BGP, uh, eventually go through the local network and the, the regional office of our ISP. It eventually gets back to the local router. The local router looks at this packet and says, I remember this. This was something that I did network address translation on. It reverses the network address translation and sends it back to the local computer. Uh, finally, <laughs> it gets the local computer, and we can open a, uh, we can finally know the IP address. We can finally open a connection to google.com uh, at long last. So before, we were using UDP. That's generally used for DNS because it's simpler and faster. Uh, but we're going to end up using TCP for HTTP just by convention. Uh, the internet is a dangerous place for packets. Most of the packets get to their destination successfully, but there's some percentage that get dropped along the way, usually due to either network congestion or corruption on one of the intervening routers. Uh, with UDP, there's no recourse for that. When we sent out our original DNS query, we just started a timer in the background. And if we didn't get a reply within a certain threshold, we would just send it again and assume, well, maybe it'll work this time. Uh, TCP gives us slightly better guarantees. So TCP offers uh, reliable stream-oriented in-order delivery of packets. So it means that packets will be resent if missing, and the data will, ne will never be delivered in the wrong order. If we send two DNS queries, we have no idea what order they're going to arrive in. They could order, you know, it could be the order we sent them, or it could be in the opposite order. So just like with UDP, there's a packet header, although it's a little bit more complicated because TCP does so much more. Uh, just like we had with UDP, though, we have the source port and destination port. So by convention for HTTPS, that will be the destination port will be 443. We have a whole bunch of information related to sending information. So uh, sequence numbers are used to provide where in the data stream is this pack does this packet lie. Acknowledgement numbers are used to encode. Uh, on the way back, which packets have you seen so far? And the window number is, how many packets am I allowed to send? Uh, the checksum field, again, just like in IP and UDP, used to ensure that the headers don't get corrupted during transmission. Uh, offset and urgent pointers are used to speed up decoding a bit. And then there's room for options, which are not really used much. Uh, and finally, we have these little six one-bit control fields. Uh, some of those are not used, but some of them are used constantly. So. Let's see what those are used for. When you want to establish a TCP connection, you have to do this sort of three-way packet exchange called a three-way handshake. Um, this is used to set up the TCP connection uh, and make sure that both sides have access to the information they need from the other in order to ensure reliable communication. So the, the way this starts is first the client sends a packet to the server with that SYN bit set. SYN stands for synchronize. So this is asking, please synchronize with me. We are going to begin a connection. This includes a random sequence number, and the acknowledgment is set to zero because it hasn't received any packets. And it's saying, here is my starting sequence number. Uh, sequence numbers are picked randomly so that people can't inject packets in the middle there. Uh, back in the olden days, they just started at one, and that was bad because you could predict them, and then you could slide data in between other people's packets. Um, 
But so our SYN packet gets to Google's HTTP server finally. Uh, it sends back a packet with both the SYN and ACK, ACK stands for acknowledge, uh, bits set, and includes its own random sequence number different from uh, our random sequence number, and it puts our sequence number in the acknowledge field. So that packet gets back to us. We can see that the server correctly has our sequence number based on the acknowledge field on the reply packet. So we then send uh, a final ACK packet up to the server. The server can then see we have its sequence number, and communication can begin. So TCP uses those sequence numbers and acknowledgments that every time you send a packet, you increment the sequence number. And every now and then, when you exceed the window value, so you send 10 packets, the server will then send back a packet saying, I acknowledge I just got up through number 10. Uh, again, normally these don't actually start at one, they start at some random large number, but that would be complicated to look at. So you send a whole bunch of packets, the server acknowledges them. Uh, here you can see we sent uh, 11 through 20, and the server sends back, I acknowledge I got up to 15. So that means uh, somewhere 16 and higher got dropped. Now maybe 17 still made it, but 16 didn't. So that means we're just going to resend everything that we don't know if they have or not. Uh, TCP has been retrofitted and upgraded with more optional stuff and supplemental standards than just about anything else in the history of the internet. Uh, most of these are transparent upgrades or improvements, but if you want to go learn about how TCP works in the real world, you're going to have a lot of reading. Finally, we have a TCP connection open. Uh, the browser can start to send data to google.com. If this was plain HTTP, uh, we could just jump directly to requesting the web page, but usually these days it's going to be done over HTTPS, so we need to create a TLS connection. Uh, TLS means the same thing as SSL. They are the same thing. SSL is an early name for TLS. It was last seriously used in 1999, so please call it TLS. You will make me cry a little bit less. Just like TCP is an abstraction for stream-oriented data in a dangerous environment like the internet, TLS is an uh, abstraction for an encrypted stream of information. Um, it means that we can tunnel information over this sort of encrypted, secure method without knowing anything about what's inside it or the network that it's traveling over. Uh, it, T TLS also allows either side to strongly, identicate, uh, strongly uh, authenticate or prove their identity with a cryptographic proof. Generally, only the server is doing that. That's the HTTPS certificate. It's proving this is really who I am, I promise. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the specifics of the cryptography involved in TLS because that is a whole other talk and there's a lot of really good ones out there and you should definitely watch some of those, but we would be here all day. So I'm just going to talk about the protocol pieces involved in TLS. So uh, TLS Handshake has uh, the same general idea as a TCP Handshake. We're going to exchange a whole bunch of information used to configure and establish the connection. Uh, the, uh, every TLS Handshake starts with a client hello, so you send this up to the server. It contains a large random value to be used later and also includes the list of ciphers and TLS versions that the client supports. The server then sends back a server hello. The server hello indicates which specific cipher and TLS version out of the ones that the client supports. The server is saying, I want to use this one out of the ones that you offered me. Uh, usually after that, there'll be a certificate message saying, here is my proof of identity. After that, there'll usually be a server key exchange, which is used to negotiate a little bit of specific information based on which cipher has been selected. And finally, there's a server hello done saying the server is agreeing to be finished with this phase of the handshake. So then we have round two. The client sends a client key exchange. So like the server key exchange, this is used to negotiate information related to the specific encryption that's being used. And then it sends this message called change cipher spec. When we're starting a TLS connection, it sort of boots up in this default unencrypted mode because we haven't agreed on encryption stuff. So we all have to just send data in, in clear text. Change cipher spec is the way the client indicates everything after this is going to be encrypted using the stuff we have already agreed on. Uh, after that, it sends a finished message. The finished message says, I am done with the handshake. It also serves as a fail-safe check because after the change cipher spec, everything, including the finished message, will be encrypted. That means that if anything related to negotiation has failed, the server won't be able to decrypt the finished message and the connection won't proceed. Similarly, server does the same thing, sends a change cipher spec saying everything after this will be encrypted using all the stuff we already agreed on, sends its own finished message. Again, finished message is encrypted, so if the client hasn't completed the negotiation successfully, the client won't be able to move on because it won't decrypt the finished message. And after that, TLS basically goes transparent. Um, we're going to wrap HTTP data in TLS uh, messages and send them back and forth, but on either end, that's just being sort of wrapped and then unwrapped. So it doesn't have to know anything about the details that it's being run inside TLS. You know, inside our browser, there's sort of logically discrete entities. It's going to make an HTTP request, wrap it in TLS, get all the way up to the server, unwrap the TLS, and hand it to the normal HTTP serving code. 
So quick review, we've done a DNS query to find the IP address of www.google.com. We've established a TCP connection to that IP address. Then we've established a TLS connection with the web server at that IP address. And we are finally ready to send an HTTP request to get our web page. Uh, HTTP is probably the piece of this journey you're all most familiar with. It's a text-based protocol, request response model, just like DNS before. Um, HTTP requests have three parts. So the first is the status line. That has the verb that we're using, which is get, the path that we're asking for, which is slash, and the protocol version that we are asking to use, which is HTTP version 1.1. After that, we have some headers. The host header is required on all HTTP 1.1 uh, requests, but there's a whole lot of other optional headers. And if you've ever, lo ever looked at a debugging trace from a browser, you'll see lots more stuff that it includes. Uh, and then after that is the body, which will be empty for a GET request. So again, remember, this is all nested all the way down. Uh, we have an HTTP request ready. It goes inside TLS. It goes inside TCP. That goes inside IP. That goes inside Ethernet. It all gets sent up to the local router. The local router does the whole same thing, it sends it across the ISP's backbone. This time, instead of just going to another office within our ISP, we're going to jump probably from our ISP to another ISP to another ISP. We'll eventually, so using the same process, get to the local Google.com web server, because they have web servers all over the world. Um, but it's exactly the same as with our DNS data. Uh, assuming everything has gone smoothly, and so many things have happened so far, that's not always the case, we'll eventually get an HTTP response back from Google's server. Uh, again, first line is special in an HTTP response. It has the protocol version that the server has agreed to use and the status code. Uh, after that, we have a bunch more headers, just like we had with the request. We have a blank line, and then we have a body. HTTP was designed to be generic, so it can serve things like images or movies or audio files. But in this case, we're going to get back some HTML text. Uh, after the first request, there's probably going to be a couple of other things, load the image, load some JavaScript, et cetera. But realistically speaking, at this point, we have accomplished our goal. Uh, we have navigated our packets all the way over the network, all the way back several times, hundreds of times in some cases. Uh, and we are finally rewarded with the search box we all know and possibly love. Uh, it's important to remember this half hour, 40 minute discussion covers about 150 milliseconds of actual time. Uh, for all of its failings, the internet is remarkably fast, responsive, and useful. Uh, also remember that basically everything that I described was designed in the 70s or 80s. Uh, so now the final question, how does the internet work? Surprisingly well. Any questions? <laughs>